Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. It's hard to give houseplants the right amount of water. Today, we're looking at building a self-watering pot. Also, garden chemicals have a label for a reason. Today, we're going to show you how to read it. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Tanya Ashworth. Tanya is the garden educator at the Dixon Gallery Gardens in Memphis, Tennessee, and Mr. D will be joining me later. All right, Tanya, we get so many questions at the Extension Office about watering houseplants. How much? Yes. Right. Well, it depends a lot on the type of plant yes. that you're talking about. Um, but I'm going to teach you a little trick of the trade Yes, teach today. us a, a trick. We need that for yes. sure. Yes. So, um, when I, my very first job out of college, okay. moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, cool. and I was an interior plant technician, which meant I walked around the city <laughs> with a watering can uh -huh. and took care of plants in office buildings. Um, the U.S. Mint, really cool places oh, cool. all over the city. Okay. And so um, I'm going to show you the self-watering container system that we used nice. uh, there. And um, keep in mind, though, that not every single house plant is going to be well suited for this system. Okay. Most are, but there are some plants that like to go really dry, like your, it used to be called Sansevieria, mm -hmm. but now they've changed the name to Dracaena, but mother-in-law's tongue is tongue. one. Right. Cactus, maybe not so much. Right. Um, ponytail palms, mm -hmm. because they have that base that they hold water. Right. But for most of your tropical plants, a self-watering system is a great way to go because it takes the guesswork out yes. and it keeps the plants evenly moist. Good. It's also really good if you just forget to water. Maybe you only want to water once every other week, which is why we use the system. Okay. We could put our plants on a two-week rotation. Nice. And uh, so, yeah, it's a great method to use. Yes, please teach us that method for sure. Okay, right. so you can buy self-watering containers at the store, but we made our own there, and this oh, is how okay. we did it. You start with a decorative pot, no holes in the bottom. No holes. No okay, holes. All right. <clears throat> and then that's the first component of your self-watering system. Then you need a riser. Your riser can be, this is a, just a saucer from a clay pot, it can be a piece of a brick, it can be, mm. we used heavy duty styrofoam, whatever can be submerged constantly is okay to put in the bottom okay. of your container as your riser. Okay, and then the third component is you need to get yourself um, some capillary mat fabric. This is a whole lot like felt. Okay. This is used in the nursery industry. They place these capillary mat fa fabrics underneath uh, seedling trays, and you can water directly on this fabric and it soaks it in from the oh, bottom. But we're gonna cut that. ours into strips. Okay. This is readily available online. You can just you know, search in your search engine for capillary mat fabric. And then if you'll hand me that plant okay, over sure. there. And what kind of plant is it? This people? is a Monstera. Okay. which is very hot right now, <laughs> uh, but this is a Monstera, and we are going to put our uh, capillary mat strips into the uh, drainage holes of the nursery container. Now, a lot of people, when they buy an interior plant, the first thing they want to do when they get home is take it out of this grow pot and pot it in something else. Okay. Um, that's really not necessary. The only reason that'd be necessary is if there's way too many, if it's uh, roots everywhere and uh, girdled. So, I'm um, sorry, let me just move this over. Um, so if, it, if there's roots going everywhere and it seems pot bound, yeah. But okay. most of the time you don't have to do that for two, three years sometimes. They're fine in these uh, pots. So I take my capillary strip and I'm using a long screwdriver and you're just gonna shove it into the drainage hole huh. here. How about that? You know, make sure you get it in there pretty good. Okay. And you leave some to dangle so that it will reach to the bottom of your deco pot after this is on the riser. Okay. Ah. You want to do at least two strips, one on each side. And get it in far enough. Yes. Yeah, okay. How about that? Mm hmm Now it's able to soak up from the bottom of your ah, container. Okay. That's the basics 
of a self-watering system. And then you just put this down in here and you water right straight into this space and you can fill up the entire water reservoir, maybe it's two or three inches tall, that riser, and uh, you won't have to worry about it until that reservoir is empty. Wow. Now, let's say you've got a ginormous pot and you're not gonna be able to see in the bottom to see if there's any water oh, in that okay. reservoir, what do you do? Well, you need a few more things to go in your pot at that point. So, this is just clear plastic tubing, which I bought on the internet. It's used for like shipping and things like that. And you cut it to size. So, the height of your container, you want to cut little notches in the bottom to allow the water to go in. All right. They come in different lengths, but usually you'll have to buy your tubing and then cut it to size, which is what I did with that one. Okay. And I see it's easy to cut. Yes, so just scissors. Okay. Okay, since I already know this one's the right length, I'm okay. just going to pop that right down in there. It's right there. Okay. Then you're going to make a bobber. <laughs> bobber, all right. <laughs> now this is 3 sixteenths of an inch plastic tubing. You get this from aquarium supply stores or pet supply on the internet. Okay. Um, we use all sorts of things in gardening, don't I we? I see. <laughs> Make use of everything. <laughs> yes. All and right. then you're going to cut it to size. You're going to want it to, to cut it off to where it'll be even with the top of that tube. Very simple to cut. But I'm going to leave a little bit more because we're going to put a bobber on it. Gotcha. Okay, this is, I know most of you have this at home. <laughs> it's just uh, I think we know what that cork. is. Yeah. <laughs> So I took, if you can find them, these are, you know, dangerous now, but uh, ice pick. Uh, yeah. Make your little hole there, your ice pick. And then you can use some hot glue too, if you need to make it where it won't come out. Okay. But you're gonna put this little piece of clear plastic tubing into your cork like that. Okay, so mine didn't go in that far, so now I'm gonna cut the top like this. Gotcha. All right, then, to make it look pretty, because this doesn't look attractive, <laughs> this is foam from an upholstery store. Like if you were going to reupholster a chair or something. Okay. This is the most expensive component of all of this, by the way. You would not believe how expensive foam is. How about that? But anyway, I've already measured this, and you just cut it with uh, regular scissors or a serrated knife actually works the okay. best. And you make yourself a little collar, and we're going to hide all of this. Look at that. How about that? We're going to hide it all with just inexpensive <laughs> Spanish moss. You can use pebbles. You can use any kind of moss that you'd like to use. I love gardeners. <laughs> <laughs> make everything look so pretty, Resourceful, right? Resourceful, right? Oh, God. Resourceful makes it look beautiful. And then maybe if we had a little more, I might put a little more and hide the foam real well. <laughs> but um, in the end, <laughs> you're yeah. not going to see all of that. You're going to see it, right? Right, right. That's funny. You'll cover up the foam and all you and this is clear. Okay. And now let me show you the right way to water it. Now okay. the first the first this is a brand new system. So the very first time you water it, you're gonna water from the top to saturate. Make yeah, sure you saturate. get the soil yeah. saturated and you're gonna fill up that reservoir. Okay. I think watering is the number one question you get about houseplants these days. Yes. What do you think? Water, how much do you yeah, water? Yeah, how much do you water? And then probably insect problems yes. are number two. Look, that oh, bobber is already starting already to float. It is. How about that? So another thing you can do, Golly. you can, if you're, this is a really big container, you could measure how tall your riser is. Let's say my riser is two inches tall. Okay. Then you get a Sharpie, measure two inches, make a Damn, mark. Okay. And when the bobber is up where that mark is, you know your reservoir is full. And so now to check your plant, you do this. If it floats, <laughs> you're done. Yeah, that, and that's pretty much all there is to it. A little DIY for you. I like that. That's, that's pretty neat. Good. We yeah. need to get more people to do this. Yeah, yes. That way you don't have the, quarter, the question about the watering, right? Right. You can, you know, oh if you tell gosh. us what kind of plant you've got, we can tell you this is great for aglaonemas and oh, uh, pothos, philodendron, all of your uh, tropical 
uh, plants that like to stay evenly moist. Okay. And for the now, most part, like you said, what's pretty inexpensive yeah. other than the foam? Yes. The in? only problem is uh, you may have to buy these in oh, okay. a, a multi-pack. It's hard to find just one of these. Okay. Um, and the foam. But after you have all of your components, then you can make a bunch. So. Tanya, thank you much. You're so welcome. Oh, that is pretty neat. Pretty neat. Got to get one of these at home, y'all. Thank you, Tanya. Mm -hmm. I was asked to uh, demonstrate my little cedar uh, for planting fine small seeds. The uh, spice jars that no longer are usable makes a great plant, uh, way of uh, putting in real fine seeds. It's already got a bunch of perforations in it. You really only need about two holes. So you, all you do is take a little piece of tape and cover all but two holes or one hole so the seeds are very fine and that's it. All you have to do now is just pop the lid. You put your seeds in, put the cap back on, and just go ahead and spread your seeds. If you got some little bit larger seeds, you can just take this little tab that comes up here and you got uh, for big seeds. Real easy, real simple, and dirt cheap. Hi, right, Mr. D. We always tell folks to read the label. We always tell folks to read the label. If we don't, we made a mistake. That's right. And forgot to. That's right. Because anytime you use a pesticide, it's extremely important to read and heed That's right. the label. Heed. Yeah. And heed and heed. There's probably a lot more money went into developing <laughs> the label on these products than went into the active, you know, the product that's in the bottle right because it takes years for a product to be labeled it's wow. tested in the field it's looked at for several years and in, it's tweaked the rates are tweaked mm -hmm. by biologists and researchers and and when the label is finally approved by the environmental protection agency uh, then you're good to go mm -hmm. and because of that uh, you and I can make no recommendation that's right. Uh, that's off-label. Mm -hmm. we, we can't make any recommendation that's inconsistent that, right. with what, what's on this label. Now, all labels, there, there are things that are required by federal law to be on every pesticide label. And I've got a few examples here, and I'm going to go through okay, let's do that. some of those things, all right. not all of them. Okay. Uh, it's pretty easy to go to the law and find out exactly what has to be on every pesticide label. Sure. But the, the, the first thing that I look for on, on a pesticide is the active ingredient. First thing I look for. That's and right. uh, this is an example. This is a, the trade name is Seven. Right. The active ingredient is down here on the bottom in real small print, kind of like on some of the food items that we look at. Uh, and this is carbaryl. 22.5% carbaryl. So I know that's the active ingredient, and that's the only pesticide that's in here. It is 77 77.5% other ingredients. Mm -hmm. Now, so I see that. Uh, so every pesticide label is going to have the trade name, it's going to have the active ingredient and the percent active ingredient. Okay. That's not all <laughs> of the label. Oh, if you notice, it. this is not just one page label. This, this has a, 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 a the insects that it will kill, if it's a herbicide, it'll have the weeds that it'll kill. If it's a fungicide, it'll, it'll have the diseases mm -hmm. that it's designed to control. And when you, when you open it to page one, yeah, it's a book. Yeah, it's it a is. Book attached it's a to mini this book. container. <laughs> uh, this tells you first aid. Yeah. Every pesticide label has instructions on first aid. It, uh, there's a note to the physician. Yeah. If someone is poisoned, or accidentally ingest one of these products, it's very important that you take the label with you, mm -hmm. take the product with you to the doctor, because here, the note to the physician tells the doctor what the antidote is. Right. Atropine is anecdotal. Uh, it's got a telephone number for medical emergencies, 24 hour a day telephone number that you can call. Talks about precautions uh, regarding pets, mm. animals, and, and children. And, you know, environmental hazards, you know, you do I not want to spray it very close to my fish pond? Uh, this will tell you when you look at the environmental hazards. Right. Uh, every label 
somewhere on that label has this statement right here, and, I, and this is the only thing that I'm going to read word for word. All right, let's go for uh, it. Under directions for use, it says, it is a violation of federal right. law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. Read the entire label before using this <laughs> there product. It goes. They're really very interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting yeah. reading, especially yeah. well if you're an airline. Right? Well, yeah, yeah, we reading. do it. All but about. you learn a lot, and and uh, it's so important because trade names change, change. active yes. ingredients yeah. change, yes. and uh, uh, there are restrictions. That have a list of do nots uh, <laughs> that that uh, you go through, and then as you get further over in here, oh, storage and disposal how to dispose of the container when you get finished mm. and how to store it. Mm -hmm. And you know, very, very important information to know. Uh, most pesticide containers, you can triple rinse them. Mm. You know, once you, you finish, triple rinse them, put the product back in your, in your sprayer, uh, you know, as you're finishing up and, and then you can throw the container in the garbage most of the time. Mm. But you need to read the you section read on storage right. and disposal to make sure. Uh, <clears throat> it'll go, uh, there'll be specific instructions on different crops you know, this is blackberries, blueberries, ornamental trees, shrubs and flowers, uh, you know, everything that you can use it on. If it's not on here, I can't recommend that you That's use right. it. <laughs> if you accidentally That's spray right. it on your broccoli plant and lo yeah. broccoli is not on uh -huh. here, yeah. I cannot suggest that you eat that broccoli. Mm. I mean, it's, you can't make any right. recommendation that's inconsistent with the labeling. Uh, one other thing that all labels have is a signal word. It's mm -hmm. a very <laughs> simple signal word. The, 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 the caution, warning, and danger. Yes. Most of the products that we see at the, at the uh, you know, lawn and garden centers, most of them have caution on them. And I'm, let me show you, I'm gonna show you on all of these products where that word is. It's all caps, all capital letters here, caution. Let me grab this one over here. This is horticultural oil. Mm -hmm. All seasoned horticultural and dormant spray oil. Look, caution. There it goes. Yeah. The caution is low toxicity. That means it's low toxic, toxicity, uh, low mammalian toxicity, so it's not that toxic mm -hmm. to humans or, or mammals. Roundup, herbicide, look here. Caution. Mm -hmm. Cap, all caps. Uh, I've got an example of an agricultural pesticide label that I took off of a two and a half gallon jug right here. I didn't want to bring the jug in, but it's Lord's <laughs> Band 4E. Look, warning. Warning, mm. yeah. So warning yeah. indicates that the product is moderately toxic. Mm. This one happens to be also a restricted use pesticide. Mm -hmm. So a homeowner can't buy Lord's Band. But again, warning is moderately toxic. Mm -hmm. Most Restricted use pesticides carry the signal word Warning. danger. Okay. And if they carry the signal yeah. word danger and the word poison is also on there, and you'll see a little uh, diagram of a skull, skull and crossbones. Cross that's right. <laughs> so that <laughs> should right. tell you if it's, if, it's, if it's danger, that means that it is highly toxic by at least one route of exposure. Okay. Which could be, and there are several routes of exposures, and it is on the label. We'll tell you which route to look for. It could be inhalation, you breathe it in. It could be ingestion, or through your skin. Okay. And, mm -hmm. Wow. But that's read the label. Read, the read the label. and stuff, heed man. the label. Very, very important. Look, I have one last question for you, though. Okay. We have a label. We can't just deface the label, can we? You you've got to follow the label, okay. and you've got to use the product in the container according to the label instructions. You can't take the product out of this container, put it in another container that's not labeled right. because you need to have the label with the product all the time. Uh, but this is a, this is a, a legal document that you know, we're bound by law to follow. And the label is the law. The label is the law, mm -hmm. that's right. This is the good stuff. There's a difference between good law stuff. and policy. This is not a policy that That's we generally law. follow from time to time like I used to do in my work before I retired. This is <laughs> the law, and you've got to follow the law. <laughs> got to follow it. you got to follow the law. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> D. We appreciate that. <laughs> it's good stuff. Milkweed is a very important plant to have in your garden because it's the host plant 
for the monarch butterflies caterpillars. This is the only thing that they will eat. So it's very important that we grow it. Now, unfortunately, it's also a favorite plant for these little bright yellow aphids and they are completely covering these things up. So the thing is, we want to protect our monarch caterpillars. We don't want to hurt them with an insecticide. So what we can do is just hose it off with water to try to get as many of the aphids off of that, that we can or we can just simply wait for the ladybugs to show up because pretty soon um, we'll have our beneficial insects arriving in our garden in the form of uh, ladybug larvae. Make sure you know what they look like so you don't kill them and adult ladybugs and they'll help take care of the problem too. But for now, since we don't see any ladybugs, I'm just going to hose them down. Now we're not going to get every single aphid this way and you may have to do this every day for a while because they will come back quickly. All right, that took care of most of our aphids. All right, Tony, here's our Q&A segment. You ready? Yes. Great questions here. All right, here's our first viewer email. I recently decided to add some color to my apartment patio with bleeding hearts and a peony. They have done absolutely wonderful, and I'm looking to expand. The problem is that I'm a first-time grower. My balcony isn't the largest, and it gets mostly shade and three to four hours of afternoon sun. Are there any specific flowers or vegetables that I can successfully grow on my balcony? This is Jordan from Memphis, Tennessee. I like that. First time grower. You know, yes. she wants to get involved. I think yes. that's really good. Wants to add some color to her balcony. So can we help? Yes, huh? absolutely. Uh, I just love it when somebody takes up gardening as a yes. hobby. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, unfortunately, you've got too much shade to grow any vegetables. Huh. And really, herbs are going to be tricky in okay. Uh, okay. three to four hours of sun. They really like six like your vegetables do. Okay. Although you, you probably can get away with trying some rosemary uh, in the pots. Okay. But you're going to be growing things in containers obviously and yes. you can there are a wide range of things that you can grow. As far as annuals you can do coleus. Coleus can take some shade, impatience, and begonias. And there's just a multitude of different kinds of begonias that you can grow. Okay. Uh, your standard begonias, angel wing begonias. Oh, yeah, you like can those. have lots of fun with begonias. And then as far as perennials, things that you can plant and will come back every year, hostas. And since you're a new gardener, <laughs> don't panic when they die don't all the way panic, to the right, ground. Right. They're going to come back the next year. <laughs> uh, hookahs, a uh, common name is coral bells. Mm -hmm. um, creeping Jenny for a nice little spiller there on uh -huh. the edge of the containers. And you can also try a lot of different cool ferns. So lots of things you can play with. Lots of things to play with. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Now I will add this. If you got four and a half hours or five hours of sunlight, there are some vegetables you could try, and they'll okay. be your leafy vegetables. Yeah. Yeah, your lettuce, you mm -hmm. know, your kale, cauliflower, broccoli. Uh, if you had just a little bit more sunlight, you can get away with those. Yeah. Yeah, again, your leafy vegetables. And those are cool seasons. And they're cool seasons. And you want right. to plant those around Valentine's Day. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm glad you pointed that out. So there you have it, Jordan. Good luck, and congratulations on being a first-time gardener, right? Yes, yeah. it's we think that's pretty us. neat. Uh -huh. Pretty neat. Thank you much. All right, here's our next viewer email. There are several yellowing and spotted leaves on my gardenia, and I cannot pinpoint the cause. I tried to research this online, but still am not sure what the problem is. And this is Amy from Memphis, Tennessee. So what do we think the problem is with the gardenia? Because there's definitely a lot of spots on those leaves. Yes, I was looking at the spots. Mm -hmm. You could see that they were kind of brown and um, bullseye kind of pattern almost. Yeah, you can see mm -hmm. rings. The concentric, concentric rings. rings right. Which makes me think maybe that's rhizoctonia um, and usually caused by too much moisture. Uh -huh. Also, I've got a gardenia in my backyard uh, here in Memphis and they're kind of marginal in Memphis anyway, mm -hmm. but it's on the south side of the house. Anyway, um, too much moisture. So, uh, Mine get yellow leaves too because my dogs like to dig underneath them and then the rain just sits there. And so I understand I have also yellowing leaves and, and too much moisture is probably why. I think it's too much moisture, but what, what can she do about that though? You know, at this point. I mean, yeah, not a lot. It's going to be I mean, tough. We just had a really wet spring. Yes, we did. Yeah. Yes. Yes, no doubt about that. And two, if you notice the picture of the plant, is it's pretty close to the house. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe it's not getting that air circulation it needs to dry those leaves off. So that's that would be a concern uh, yeah. you know, to me as well. Yeah, if you could move it, maybe it would help. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you could move it, of yeah. course, make sure it's in a well-drained area, right? Yeah. Kind of plant it up a little bit and get the water off his feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, off his roots, so to speak. All right, Miss Amy, hope that helps you out. Here's our next viewer email. 
I have many Japanese maples and in the spring whole branches or sections of the trees don't leaf out. These branches die and I have to remove them. My reading has said this might be a bore, but I see no real evidence of this. I know my pH is very high. Could this be a cause? I put elemental sulfur down around some of my evergreens, which helps. How do I keep the limbs of my Japanese maples from dying? This is Corey on Facebook. Good question is the one that we get quite often. So, so what are you thinking? I'm thinking environmental conditions. That's what I'm Mm -hmm. um, it could be too much sun. Some Japanese maples like to be planted more in shade. It just depends on the variety. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're trying to grow one that likes shade and too much sun, um, it could be not getting enough water in the summer. It could be drought issues. Uh, if you have heavy wind, when the buds start to break, it dry the buds out. Yeah. There are different reasons why that might be happening. It's just so many, yeah, so many uh, you know, different causes. It could be too much mulch. Yeah. It could be planted too deep, but what I'm thinking is, let's go back to our weather pattern, you know, especially last year to this year. Sun scald might be an issue, and if mm -hmm. sun scald was an issue, then of course it's going to cause cracks in the trunk. Those cracks over time are going to get what? Start getting bigger. Mm -hmm. and once it gets bigger, it compromises the uptake of water and nutrients to the upper part or the upper canopy of that tree which causes limbs to die because right. they're not getting water and the nutrients they need. Mm -hmm. So that may be an issue as well. But at the end of the day, how about just pruning out those dead limbs? Yeah. We just start with that and just kind of see what happens, you think? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, Corey, we hope that helps you out. So, good luck with your Japanese maple. Mm -hmm. All right. Tanya, it's been fun as always. Yes. Thank you much. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road. Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. We ran through how to build the pots pretty quick. If you want to go back and watch it again, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We also have lots of other good videos there. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.